You're listening to The Invisible Addiction, a podcast series investigating problem gambling in the UK. In this episode, I speak with Richard Flint, non-executive board member at Flutter PLC and the former CEO of Skybat. I wanted to hear his point of view on problem gambling. What is his experience with problem gamblers? What are his views on the current landscape of the gambling industry? And how would he make gambling safer in the future? It was so interesting to hear from someone with Richard's experience, and I hope you enjoy his open and honest opinions in this podcast. You can reach out to Richard on Twitter, at Yorkshire Flint. Finally, if you haven't already, do check out theinvisibleaddiction.com with links to podcasts, blogs, blog posts, and more importantly, support networks in the UK for people struggling with gambling problems. Without further ado, here is the conversation between Richard and I. Enjoy. Okay, so joining us on the other end of the line today is Richard Flint, former CEO of Skybet. And um, I'm very privileged to have him on today and uh, to join the discussion um, about uh, problem gambling and uh, his experiences. Uh, I must say, actually, before we start, uh, Mr. George Cooper was supposed to be in on the interview and uh, is, is unfortunately unwell today. So I'm um, sending uh, our best wishes to, uh, to George. So first of all, uh, Richard, how, how are you doing? How are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, uh, we're sort of... Uh... I um, uh, live up in Yorkshire, um, as we've talked about before, Alex, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, with family up here, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a reasonable place to be over a lockdown, but I'm glad that things are easing, and hopefully we, uh, we won't we'll be able to carry on living, a, uh, well, have, carry on getting out and about for the next few months, but yeah, it's a, it's a nice place to be, so we're all fine. Very nice, thank you, yes, and... Uh... I mean, I suppose to sort of tee up the conversation, just to sort of walk you through. I mean, I'd like this to be a bit more of a discussion as opposed to a sort of strict um, sort of right. interview. Um, I mean, there's a whole host of subjects that we could sort of touch upon today. Um, but I mean, do you know what? Do you, do you want to just maybe spend like a, a minute or two, just perhaps just talking about your background and experience? Yeah, sure. I mean, I won't. Yeah, I'll keep it fairly brief. But I guess the, the relevant parts of my experience is that, um, well, I sort of started in uh, the online betting world um, in around 2000. And I really came from a sort of product technology background. I joined a startup called Flutter.com that was all about very social sort of, I, you know, I'll bet you a tenner uh, over, over the internet that Arsenal will beat Man U or whatever it turns out to be. Um, did that for a couple of years, it was sort of mixed success. Then um, went to Sky uh, in 2001. Um, and it was really sort of the early days of Sky Bet. It was actually called Surrey Sports at that point. Um, I worked for three or four years with with sort of Central Sky with this offshoot that we'd acquired um, that was based up in Yorkshire that was called Surrey Sports. I worked with them for two or three years and then um, moved up in 2005 uh, and took over what was quite a small uh, company then um, had just been rebranded to Skybet in 2006, and it really, um, you know, had a had a, a very rich and you know uh, generally positive experience running Skybet from sort of 2006 time to 2018 um, when we were acquired by the Stars Group, which is primarily Poker Stars, and then uh, that business um, has in turn been acquired by Flutter, which is Paddy Power Betfair, and now joined the board. Uh, as a non-exec of um, the combined group, uh, which is a you know sizable company, sizable international company, um, but I guess mo- you know most relevantly for this, um, really over the last, yeah, you know, in the last five years, I guess, um, you know, I didn't really, I'm not, I didn't really come from a sort of um, betting background way back. Um, you know, the last five years, are sort of the the problem gambling side, the regulatory side, the industry reputation. Uh, the role of technology, you know, the mix of responsibilities between the operator and, and the um, and the gambler, all those sort of things that will come on to talk about. They, they became an ever ever larger part part of uh, how I spent my time in, in in the job and became obviously became an interest as well. Um, so you know, looking forward to talking about um, those issues, you know, from from a sort of industry point of view, to some degree. Yeah, no, that's um, thanks very much. I mean, um, 
yeah, it's uh, it'd be great to um, just sort of to get your to pick your brains and uh, just to get your thoughts. And um, I think we we often hear so much from uh, the problem gambling side, certainly in the, the kind of this pool, um, you know, podcasts and uh, people on, online and stuff. So it would just be really nice to just get your your point of view. And um, if there's anything that you don't feel comfortable talking about. Um, you know, please just say and uh, sure. Well, I, I hope there wouldn't be, but yeah, I will say. <laughs> there is. I can't imagine what that would be, but you never know. <laughs> so, um, I don't know where to start. I mean, Sky. Well, bet- t- t- just a bit about. I mean, I'm quite interested to know. I know many of your listeners will know this already, but yeah. you know, and I'm somewhat familiar with it. But you know, it'd be good to sort of uh, get your exp- your background as well in this on this yeah. subject. Yeah, no, of course. I'm. I'm, I'm always. Um, you know always keen to sort of throw in sort of my own experience. So, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose for me, um, gambling kind of kicked off at sort of like when I was about 18. And um, I'm, I'm from a place called Newbury, uh, which is sort of famed for uh, the sort of horse racing track, um, amongst other things. And uh, uh, Vodafone, I think, the HQ there. And um, and Highclere Castle, it's got lots of stables nearby. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's sort of, you know, synonymous for horse racing and um, everyone sort of has a link. Uh, so sort of when it was sort of between sort of 16, 17 and 18, that even at that early age, it was always quite a, a big thing to go to the races, um, you know, get dressed up and have a drink and have a flutter. Um, yeah. Obviously acceptable for, you know, boys and girls to go. Um, but then it wasn't really until maybe when I was about 18, uh, sort of set foot uh, into a bookies and um, try, try my luck at football accumulators um, with, with no success. And, um, and then basically my friend was sort of acting all sort of very, you know, very quiet and was on the, uh, what, well, what we now know as the fixed off betting terminals, you know, the r- roulette. Yeah. And um, so I went across in my innocence and sort of asked him and, and said, you know, you know, what's this? Um, you know, what's going on? So these sounds and uh, this ball spinning and whatever. Uh, and then, you know, probably the worst thing that can happen to me, um, I had a go and uh, I won. Um, so from my pound, I think I won £7.20 or something like yeah. this. Um, so that was the kind of the start. And, uh, and from there, it kind of quickly became, I'd probably say, uh, probably quickly became a problem. Um, I sort of very quickly got hooked on the roulette machines, um, started to go on my own uh, instead of with friends. And... Um, and then it's it's been a it's been a sort of a love oh I say love hate relationship unfortunately mostly hate. more hate more hate yeah yeah more, more yeah. hate um, right up until well I'm 30 years old now nearly 31 um, so sort of up until about 29 um, and uh, I've, I've I've sort of dabbled well more than dabbled but uh, then sort of started to go into the casinos uh, spent some time in London um, so uh, Piccadilly you know or Leicester Square all those casinos um, I run. Uh, I ran uh, a six-a-side football business, uh, which basically, unfortunately, became my uh, sort of gambling fund, as it were. Um, uh, so I'm quite ashamed to sort of say that, but that's, that's kind of the truth. Um, and uh, yeah, so roulette was the big one for me, um, and then dropped my hand at blackjack. Um, so it got to sort of 2017, and um, finally, kind of admitted defeat. It was a real horrible time, and. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd gone to do Christmas shopping in London, well, Christmas shopping in inverted commas, um, and uh, I'd spent a uh, month's wages in one, one day um, in, uh, on the roulette and whatnot and, and all these different places and, and blackjack. And it was the only, it was, do you know what, it was the only time that uh, the croupier, um, she said, because I was the only one in the casino, I got there really early, I got there at half past nine in the morning. And um, she knew that I, you know, I was there on my own. And she asked, you know, what I'd been, you know, what I was trying to be doing, you know, doing. And um, you know, I said, oh, I'm here to do my Christmas shopping. And uh, quickly, um, sorry, <laughs> bringing up some bad memories. Um, she quickly, uh, after about half an hour or so, I'd, I'd, I'd lost several hundred pounds. And um, she sort of said, you know, I think you should probably leave. Um, and it was the only time that someone had ever said, I think you should leave. Um, and it was, it was like the cat was out of the bag. I was really embarrassed. Um, a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, but in a way it was, it was good because it was like the first time somebody actually knew my problem. Um, mm. and, uh, and that evening I self excluded, uh, from, from, from casinos. 
um, but then um, didn't do the bright thing, which was then exclude online. Um, I was sort of yeah. a bit naive and uh, then sort of just moved my, moved my operations online. Um, sort of gave up roulette because I thought, well, you know, that's, that's quite, quite a bit of a mugs game, you know, it's completely random luck and uh, got, got heavily into blackjack and um, online blackjack. Yeah. O- online blackjack. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and then later some, uh, some slots as well. So, uh, mm. so that's, and that's that, yeah. And now, and now you've, I mean, I don't know this, but I'm expecting that you um, suspect that you're now excluded online and you've, have you got any, have you had any help and counseling on that sort of thing? That's correct. Yeah. That's yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, so took private counselling. Um, that really helped me out uh, a lot, um, and uh, sort of you know part of part of groups online and stuff uh, with a chap called Jeffrey, um, who runs problem gambling support groups, um, as well as um, Ed Stoner with Now We Win, and uh, he's got a it's quite it's kind of a new uh, I, uh, a new sort of ent- uh, enterprise. I interviewed in him in. Uh, in series one of the invisible addiction and uh he um has also suffered from gambling addiction but it's now set up now we win which is um uh, a sort of social clothing brand but just sort of doing workouts uh amongst sort of chats for people that struggle with uh gambling addiction so right yeah so that's right. me and, 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 yeah no and, and, and i obviously aware that you're doing this series of podcasts i guess i guess the title of invisible addiction there must be a sort of thinking behind it that you want to raise awareness Mm. Um, because it is something that as you as I haven't got through all of your I've got through the, uh, some of your podcasts and it's uh, one of the things you say is that um, with alcoholic well, I'm, I've got more personal experience not me but friends um, who've had problems with alcohol and um, you know one of the points you make is that gambling is often harder to spot isn't it than someone with an alcohol addiction yeah yeah absolutely yeah. it's um it was it sort of came at a sort of poignant time a, a young man had sort of taken his own life um, in Newbury um from from big sort of gambling problems and um god bless him and 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 it, it sort of came it, it's sort of quite a raw time but it, it had um, a lot of support and it, it it became apparent that i think or for me that i thought i thought you know more awareness needs to uh, sort of happen um really so, uh, i completely agree on that you know i mean I'm sure we won't agree on everything but i completely agree that um that awareness has has improved but probably needs to be go further and you know, addiction to gambling, probably addiction to many other things and many other mental health issues. Uh, you know, the more we can destigmatize them, the better. The more, you know, the only way out, well, not necessarily the only way out, but an important way out of such issues is discussion, isn't it? And, and counseling and groups, which you can only really do once you, once people are open about things. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it sort of felt like, a bit cliche but it did feel like a, a big weight off my shoulders and uh but um but i'm fully aware that not everyone will get to that point you know um yeah or, or struggle to get to that point so um i don't know what, what what's your experience with sky bet and and sort of problem gamblers um i mean you know yeah well yeah, yeah so the in i mean in the i guess going way way back so i started the business early 2000 the whole the whole point of sky getting involved in uh betting in gambling is was really around the fact that it was a sports media business and uh, people were betting on the sport and they, and it was another way to, you know, in a sort of business terms, a way to monetize the sporting audience, you know, a way to sky had the sporting rights, had some technology platforms. Um, and, uh, the thinking was, well, you know, we, these people subscribe, what else do they do? Uh, they bet on the game. Uh, so if we have a betting company, we can get a share of that. Um, and you know, that, really in reality sort of was the case and that was why we started why sky started the business and that was a business that i got involved with and uh you know it's actually remained very much that that business today it's always been a sort of mass market um in relatively low stakes and you know, we used to say that it was for people that are having a bet because they're watching the game rather than watching the game because they're having a bet which i still think is true for most of the audience um and, and going back to the early days really we were a small player and if i'm honest problem gambling wasn't a big focus uh you know how the, the issues around problem gambling wasn't a big focus of the company we were mm-hmm. looking to make a uh a sick customer experience we were looking to acquire customers it was a lot about uh like any online business like the other online businesses i'm involved with at the moment it was a lot about you know the cost of a, acquiring a customer and the value of a customer and 
you acquire customers such that they're worth more than they cost. And that's the same with the dog food business, which is my main focus at the moment and was true for the online gambling business back then. Um, I guess, and, and I should also say that um, I didn't, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have any personal experience with gambling addiction. Um, most of my friends bet uh, and most of them drink alcohol. Um, and yeah, the, the issues that they've had, as I mentioned, have much more been around alcohol than betting. Uh, but so, I, yeah, so I didn't really have a sort of visceral understanding of it through personal connections. And personally, I don't, you know, uh, gambling is something I'm nowhere nowhere close to overdoing really you know I, I will bet and I like betting and I like and I like playing poker but pretty moderate levels um mm. but over I guess the first time when re- it, you know in, in sort of however long it was ago about about sort of um six or seven years ago gambling addiction became something that people spoke about more I think it was probably around when the fob tees as you, that you mentioned that you know almost started you off on your difficulties um mm. you know that was they sort of became higher profile didn't they around in terms of public discussion and you know Matt's old cousins and uh mm. the sort of campaigns there i guess they were about 2010 sort of started happening and, and through that through that and a bit through sort of customer interactions you became more and more aware of gambling addiction it was you know i'm not saying i didn't know i didn't know that it existed i didn't know anything about it but it wasn't something that was right at the top of our agenda running the company um and sort of became more and more became a more high profile issue and um probably the a sort of turning point i guess to some degree of in my understanding of it is myself and um some of the other senior team went to gordon moody uh, which as you know is um a residential um a treatment center for problem gamblers but you know people in a yeah. really severe situation and um yeah, I heard a lot about, I had a sort of a couple of talks on the people there. It's, it's funded by, a lot of the funding comes by Gambler Aware, ultimately from the industry. Um, so I had a few conversations with the people running that. And then we met um, some of the people that were staying there. Some people that were obviously pretty desperate uh, gambling addicts. Um, and uh, they didn't know that we were from Skybet. And they all told their stories about how they were, uh, the problems that it had. And one of them, you know, told his story and, the, and he'd spent, he, his primary or an almost exclusive focus for his gambling activity was Skybet. And that was, a, that was probably, that sort of was quite a sort of turning point, I guess, you know, me, I guess before that point, to some degree, I'd thought, well, you know, there are gambling addicts out there, but they're on the fob tees or in the casinos um, mm. and probably online, but with a sort of dodgy, inverted commas, dodgy operators, uh, and we don't really have any of those at, at Skybet because, yeah, you know, we were low stakes on average. Mm-hmm. But meeting someone who, who was a gambling addict, who was primarily betting with Skybet, and it was actually more the sort of casino products that he was using, casino products that we offer, um, you know, definitely uh, highlight, highlighted the issue and brought it to life more. And then since that time, with the growing uh, public focus on uh, gambling addiction and, and the online components of that, I guess I've sort of made it my made I made it my job in the last few years of the, of the company to make it much more a big part of the of the things we talked about and the culture of the business and you know through that met a lot of gambling addicts a lot of you know through Twitter in the main I met most of them through Twitter mm-hmm. um, and learnt more, much more about the issues there without claiming to be an expert have met um, I've probably met about. 30 or 40 gambling annex um and i've met worked we worked a lot with various companies including uh, someone who's a counselor um for gambling annex um a bit like the, the chat that you've worked with yeah. um and various other organizations that work with gambling annex. so try to learn more about it um and you know since that point we've you know made it something that people in the in the company had a much greater awareness of much more of a conversation we had people whose children who'd commit suicide through gambling come and talk to the company had gambling addicts to come and talk to the company i made it much more of a live issue um, a live conversation um in the company and you know obviously yeah that had to be led by me and i did that and i'm not claiming for a moment that anything that i did throughout that time was perfect and that everything is 
rosy now, uh, but it's certainly something that is has a dialogue around it, which didn't, which wasn't the case yeah. back in 2010. So, so okay. sorry, that was quite a long answer, but um, happy to dig into any any of uh, the points that came out there. Yeah, and there's lots of, you know, lots of. Uh, I don't think there's any. I think uh, if I was going to summarise what I think now, I don't think there's any easy answers, and I think we should not delude ourselves that there are any easy answers. But I think um, I think that uh, industry there is some things that. A lot of things that have changed quite a lot in the industry and a lot of things that still need to change across the industry. And there's a lot that the industry won't, can't do to, you know, that the, the industry is not going to solve the problem. I don't, I don't personally believe that in a strict sense, the industry causes the problem and I don't think the industry can solve the problem. Mm, mm, but, so it can, but it can, it can improve and not exploit people with gambling, gambling yeah. things, which has happened in the past and still happens today. Go on, what are you going to say? Well, I was going to say, I mean, there's so, so many, um, so, so many thoughts kind of uh, uh, yeah. have been spawned from, from what yeah. you said. Um, for, forgive me, I'm just going to sort of shoot from the hip. Sure. And, uh, I don't know if this is going to make any sense at all, but um, sure. I mean, now forgive me, Richard, but do you not think it was maybe a, a bit naive to think that you, you didn't have, you know, uh, sort of addicts? Yeah. Um, I do think, I do think that was naive. I agree. Yeah. I think back, you know, back, I think that was wrong. That clearly was wrong. Um, and we we did have, and we do have. And, yeah, I think that was that was wrong. I mean, it, it, I think one sort of um, risk or downside of running an online business is you don't see the customers. You know, I think if you're running, I mean, I worked in a lot of pubs when I was younger. And, you know, you know, you know the alcoholics because they're there. And, you know, same as your experience with land-based casinos. You know, you know, you, you get much more of a sense of someone who's got an issue. And mm-hmm. if you dig into the data enough and ask enough of the questions, it's it's clearly it's clear there are gambling acts. And it was absolutely was naive back in those days to think that the, there aren't yeah. people with gambling addiction uh, yeah. completely. I mean, I mean, I've got some, I've got, I've got a couple of facts here that um, I've used with uh, or, or from gambling with lives. Have you have you come across gambling with lives? Um, I have. They, uh, I don't think. I mean. I think that they think I'm um, from the dark side. So we don't have, we, whilst I've had a dialogue with many organisations, I haven't had a dialogue with them. No, no. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, look, there's some facts here, I mean, that, that I've um, sort of come across. But, uh, you know, apparently that, you know, one in four people gambling online um, are addicted to gambling or, or at risk. Um, uh, nearly half of people playing casino games online are either addicted or at risk of addiction as well. Um, I mean, do, do you think? Do you think that? Obviously, if you if you're you know in charge of Skybet, I mean, you, I, I presume you've got maybe psychologists working there, you know, to design your games or um, and whatnot, uh, or, or the thought process in there. Because because this is a really interesting thing. Is is that? Uh, um, you know, I, I I got to playing slots by the end of it. It was it was sort of desperation, um, and it's just the bright colours and the sounds and uh, the small kind of little wins. Uh, even though actually I was losing money, um, and you know, do do you think that do you think there should be a cap, a stake, you know, stake limit? Because at the moment, obviously, you know, sort of, I've, I've actually spoken to Matt's uh, cousin, who's uh, you know uh, been on the podcast as a guest and. You know, as I say, he was like you say, he was instrumental with um, you know the reduction from a hundred pound per spin to two pounds per spin, uh, which actually pretty much um, yeah, I kicked me, kicked me out of bookies almost immediately. Actually, uh, me and my friends, um, and it actually, it, it, you know, in my case, it actually stopped me or prevented me from doing uh, from gambling. Do you think? Uh, do you think that there should be a, a, a maximum stake or minimum stake? You know, sort of two pounds per spin as it were on the the slot machines which seem to be i guess they're probably quite profitable yeah well lots of things in in what you've said there as well so um i mean those facts i think you know i think that um i don't think that they are facts um they are and you know a lot of data depends on how, how you interpret it that you know the other fact in inverted commas would be that um the gambling addiction is relatively low internationally in the uk and it hasn't, despite the growth of FOB2, despite the growth of online, despite the growth of um, advertising, hasn't risen in the UK, you know, all over all that period, over the last 20 years. It's the same as it was 20 years ago. And actually, the, the most recent surveys, it's fallen. I don't know if it's... Li- 
is it, if you look at the gambling commission you look at the gambling commission the, the stats from public health england and the stats from the gambling commission you know there, there's lots of people will put out sort of facts there but they're, they're very much open to interpretation but you know my and we, you know there's no point in spending loads of time arguing about facts i think we can probably both agree that we need a stronger fact base on this that isn't isn't uh, driven by whatever organization you happen to be represent or whatever size of the argument you're, you're on um there are you know there are a number you know a sizable number of gambling addicts in the uk and you know we would all, all want that, all reasonable people would want that number to come down um and i think we and i think we'd all like better research like the um the um gambling prevalence survey i think was one of the that's been stopped for the last five years. It's, it's crazy. You know, we, we should know that thing. We should know that data better than we do at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that sort of, you know, we might disagree on some of those facts in terms of um, state, in terms of games, you mentioned that uh, games, do we have psychologists designing the games? No, but people, we, we have a lot of the games are provided by third parties, but some of them are created sort of by in-house uh, bodies and those games are desi- you know they're designed that people spin them they get a they get a buzz out of that uh and enjoyment and stimulation in the form of um whatever hormone it is you mentioned it um dopamine your dopamine yeah so people do get people spin them they get excited they get a dopamine hit and they want to spin them again mm-hmm. um that that's obvious um and any gambling game or any you know non-gambling game you, that's what people design them to do. Um, so for some people, that will result in them finding them, you know, so compelling that they'll, or so addictive, if you like, that they'll they'll play them for hours. And for other people, it won't. I mean, we like our we had you know, on Sky Vegas, which is obviously the most, um, you know, has the products that are considered to be the most addictive. I, you know, I, I struggle with sometimes with that term. But anyway, let's use it for now. You know, the, we had like 250,000 people playing in a week and they'd, you know, playing two or three days of that week and they'd average lose six pounds in the day they were playing. You know, it's, it's a pretty, there's a lot of people. It, this is our experience, which is not necessarily the same everywhere. There's a lot of people spending a relatively modest amount and stopping their activity after a, a relatively modest loss. And there are, but there are obviously some people in there that that, it, that, that didn't apply to with us and with others that would spend much more longer and much more time on it and i think that the you know the difference between online and offline is online you have an account and we have a we have and can get a lot of data on any individual and i think that means that you're better off focusing attention on those people that are spending a lot of time and money and you know interacting slash restricting those people rather than everyone which i think what you would do with a a two pound uh, limit. I, I personally don't have a huge problem with default limits on, say, slots. Uh, you know, the average, uh, you know, we had 70, 70p was the average, but not that many people spend more than two pounds with the Sky Vegas. Um, so it wouldn't have a particularly material effect. I do think that if you really focus on state limits, you either send people to other games or you send people to other operators which may be offshore you know i don't think you're addressing the root of the problem and indeed in your case it didn't really stop you gambling did it you just moved your gambling elsewhere exactly. um so i think i think i think it's sort of a bit I, I i don't have a huge problem with it i just don't think it'll make any material difference to the problem i think we're much better off you know looking at looking at people that are spending far more than they can afford and addressing that as an individual company by you know, imposing limits or ideally having that individual put their own limits on and then looking to expand those limits to as far as you can to the to the other operators but you know, in really reality you can only do that to uk licensed operators yeah. but i think if you don't sort of address the, the account and the spend uh, which you can which you have the data on, on online that you don't have offline then people just if you limit one game, people move to another type of game. If you limit another type of game, people move on to sports. You know, it's, I think you're not really solving any problem. Um, mm-hmm. You're just moving, pushing people from one thing to another, which, you know, I think has happened with the FOB2, as I said, and would happen if we did it to online slot games. Mm. Sort of a, a, a bit of a waste of time, in my opinion. Well, 
I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the thing with dopamine that, that there have been, um, uh, you know, sort of some science behind it, and they've done sort of you know research on the brain, and they've they've noticed that the dopamine levels um, are almost identical, win or lose, um, for a problem gambler. Uh, which I can relate yeah. to because it, it, you just become numb and, you know, yeah. it doesn't mean anything. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's quite a, a dangerous position to be. Um, I mean, I, again, recently just sort of read recently that, you know, Sky, Sky for example, Sky Bet, you know, have, have seen, um, uh, you know, a big increase, as it were. Um, uh, sorry, no, not just Sky Bet. Beg your pardon. Sorry, beg your pardon. The Gambling, Com- Gambling Commission have recently just revealed that, um, online slot machines increased by 25%, um, you know, play, playing in the you know, pandemic. Um, and then, you Because there's, no, there's no sports. This is exactly it. There's no people, you know, a lot of people that, who aren't gambling and it's, you know, if they can't bet on sports, they'll bet on roulette. And if they can't bet, you know, or slots. But, but these, you know, are, the, you know, these, these are surely, these are, you know, some, some of the most harmful products um or, or that's the thing products. i don't yeah i don't i don't really like i'm not closed-minded to that if it ter- if that turned out to be the case you know sky bet is pr- primarily sports betting and primarily football accumulators which is you know under pretty much all the measures is the lowest risk form of online gambling activity um but it just it's not true to say that um the issues are just in in slots and that, that you know it's a pro- i don't i don't, personally don't believe that the and it that the slots you know a lot of people play slots very modestly and if, if the slots are sort of causing the problem when we did a analysis of all the people that turned up that were um you know high high risk in terms of you know spending a lot of time and money or using multiple payment methods all the sort of flags that concern you they were equally split between sports and and gaming yeah, there was just, there's just as a proportion they're higher in gaming because fewer people play gaming, but they're split between the two. And as many people I've met that have, you know, started their issues on with horse racing, um, there are some that have had it with football and then lively. I think people do often do themselves more harm ultimately um, in the sort of rapid products because you can, you know you can get they people with gambling addictive tendencies get immersed in those products and spend them for hours and hours and, hours and lose a lot, lose more. And it's harder to break out of it. But I don't think, I, I don't think, you know, the evidence that I see in front of me isn't that those products cause addiction. You might say that they might exploit addiction, um, but I don't think they cause addiction because it's, there's so many people that play them modestly and there's so many people that run into difficulty on different products, different gambling products. So, I mean, I mean do, do you think, therefore, more research needs to be done more more you know you know treat you know research into this because obviously at the moment the industry's made you know again you know several billion profit you know um uh, but yet obviously has a voluntary levy uh, levy to pay um which is sort of a, a tiny fraction of, of that um do you do you think that the industry needs to yeah. be paying more do you think what do you think of the voluntary levy do you, do you think it's... i think it's better to have a i think it's better to have a statutory levy and i think um mm-hmm. And I think uh, I think most of the industry thinks that. To be honest, I don't really know why it hasn't happened. I think the government's concerned about there's a concern about hypothecated taxation, where you know, in general, there's a tax pot and that funds lots of things. And I think in general, I think governments don't like taxes that go to certain activities. So, um, but yeah, it, I, I think there should be a statutory levy. I think there should be more money than there has been for treatment and research, and research should be carried out by more neutral, well, ne- not more neutral, neutral as far as you can get that, like, neutral organisations. I think that the, the research in the gambling sector is very politicised. Uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of the researchers are almost campaigning anti-gambling folk, um, which is not an unreasonable point of view, but it doesn't make you neutral, just like the industry is not neutral. I think we need, you know, I come from a sort of scientific background and you know, it's incredible how people, how it's sort of evident, you know, uh, policy-based evidence making rather than ev- evidence-based policy making. Um, and I think there needs to be much more research and more neutral and separated from the industry and also separated from campaigning academics. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, ideally, I think that, yeah, I think that the money that's been committed most recently will, will result in a tenfold increase uh, in to research, education and treatment. So I don't know if you've 
read the uh, commitments to 1% of, of GGR, whereas it was previously 0.1%. Um, <clears> and I think that means it's you know, 100 million pounds uh, a year, which is an incredible, a, a growth to 100 million pound a year, which is a huge amount of money for, for this compared to what we've had before. And you know, whether it's enough or not, I think well, only time will tell, but it's a tenfold increase, uh, yeah. which is, I think, the right thing and pretty significant. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, you must have come across the sort of the Gambling Act 2005. Um, <laughs> it's now come across it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm familiar say, with oh, it. You must have, yeah. Well, <laughs> you have, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Silly question, um, <laughs> no. but, um, but obviously you've come across the Gambling Act 2005, which is 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 so outdated. You know, it references postal votes more than you know. Wi-Fi didn't exist, um, and you know, deregulated market and, and such not. And uh, I mean, it's it, it it must be. You know, it. I feel it's. It must be fair to say that you know you, you you've you've jumped on the back. You've been able to sort of jump on the back of that and, and ride that sort of wave of success because you know technology. You know, the last ten years has just completely changed our world and, and whatnot. Um, do you think it's time that we had a new gambling act? I think quite a thing. So I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't think any, these, te- I think jumped on the back is an unusual phrase to use. I think, you know, the online industry has grown on the back of technology. And um, if you go every country around the world, whatever, whatever, pretty much every country, you know, certainly the countries I'm familiar with has um, online gambling. Um, and in some countries it's legal, as in the UK, and some countries it's illegal, like there has been in the US, say. Um, so it's, you know, I actually think that the right thing to do is to legalise, which happened in 2005, and tax and regulate. And I also think that the regulation hasn't been uh, as tight as, and, and in focused in the, as the right areas on, online as it should have been. The, the Act actually, there's quite a lot of scope in the Act to regulate more than has been so and i i i don't have a, an objection to a new gambling act I, I do worry though that it'll actually take quite a few years um to be enacted and i think if you look at there's a lot of uh, powers that are open to regulators and to government in the current gambling act that could address a lot of the issues that uh that first firstly the issues we might agree on and even if you even if you're have a particularly uh you know if you want to go further than i would go um a lot you can do that within the scope of the existing act and regulation so i'm not sure we need a new gambling act certainly i don't have a huge concern if there was to be a new gambling act um i just would like to make i'd like it to be i'd like it to be on the back of better research base than we've got um and i'd like it to be well informed and to consider and look look around the world and look at what happens if you do regulate too tightly um, uh, or in the wrong ways and see what happens to the market you know this, this is the internet you can't whatever you might like to do in terms of your your city, country citizens online the actual reality of doing that and the sort of knock-on effects of it are are make it difficult to to regulate too tightly even if you think that's the right thing to do and you know you and i might i i i believe that ultimately people should be able to do with their own you know people should have quite a lot of freedom in what they do with their own money um and that by restricting everyone to say not being able to spend more than two pounds on a game of blackjack i think uh, I, don't, I don't think you're i don't think you're saying that even i don't even i don't think even the gambling lives and the ape ppg on gambling harm are saying that uh, but if you were to say that, then you know the the, amount, the move offshore would be huge. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the thing. I mean, another another thing. I, I don't know if you're aware of Matt Zarb cousin and, and clean up gambling. I don't know if you've come across this. I know, I know, Matt, I know Matt well. I've, I've had several meetings. But I, I enjoy Matt's company and yeah. I admire him a lot. And you know, we, again, we would we'd agree on quite a few things. We wouldn't agree on everything, but I think I respect a lot of what he's what he's done and how he's taken his own issues to to you know address a, uh, an issue. I mean, because yeah. one of them is, is is about you know bringing ev- offshore, bringing them back onshore, you know the operators and whatnot. Um, yeah. What what what? I, I agree with that, by the way. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's a sort of different set. Of, it's not really a solely gambling issue. That that's about jobs and taxes in the UK. But um, you know, we always ran Skybet from the UK. Um, and there are lots of actual 
reasons, perverse reasons why people locate themselves offshore, which aren't necessarily to avoid, it's just because it's, it's a long story, it's like to do with VAT laws and this sort of thing. Um, but I think solving that to make it at least neutral and hopefully favourable to locate your business in the UK, I agree with that. Mm. Um, Richard, if we may move the conversation on slightly to uh, to a sort of slightly different topic. I mean, football sponsorship, um, obviously Skybet, um, you know, Skybet Football League, you know, champion, uh, championship and League One, League Two, uh, you know, a big relationship. And uh, I grew up on and watching, you know, Gillette Soccer Saturday with uh, with Jeff. Um, and obviously that's kind of come into the fore recently with, um, you know, sponsorship and, and whatnot. Um, you know, there's been a, a big call at the moment, you know, a bit like sp what Spain have done. They, they've, banned, you know, they've taken logos off, uh, you know, gambling logos off, um, you know, shirts and whatnot. Um, do you think that should, you know, do you think that should uh, come in to this country? Do you think, um, you know, gambling should end its association or sort of gambling companies should end its association with, uh, with football? It won't surprise you to hear that. No, I don't think it should end its association. I do think that, I think pragmatically there, there's too much gambling uh, prevalence in, in football. You know, too much. The, the sort of combined impact, it's come down a bit since there was Twister ban, but the combined impact of printer boards, um, shirt sponsorship, uh, TV advertising is a bit too much. I think not least because it attracts, you know, it's... I sort of it's it's hard to sort of describe why why I think that it's part, I just think it partly causes problems for the for the industry. I mean, if and like I I think alcohol should uh, be allowed to sponsor uh, sports, but I think if there was the same level of al alcohol promotion within football as there is gambling promotion, I think as a drinker and as a you know parent of teenagers, I think I would think that was over the top. So I do think we should find a way to bring bring it down. But I think if you banned it completely you know even if you take out the even if you you know i think you, you then take out the incentive to you know you, then you then you level the playing field between onshore operators who can um sponsor and offshore operators who can't you know and, and then you know, at least at the moment you can you know the regulator and government can have some control it can can regulate uh because people want to be regulated because they want to appear on football shirts if that was to go away it'd be one lever less of control and I'd, ra I'd rather have a sort of you know safe um and well regulated and um accountable uh uk-based industry that that can sponsor and um advertise on football in moderation um you uh, also you know it's also the, the foot you know we talked about products earlier on well if you think if you think certain products are the issue then football betting is the is you know, in, in our database, it was the one with, with the least issues. So mm. why, why focus on something that has uh, the fewest issues? And also, you know, if you don't think that um, gambling companies should uh, sponsor football, then, you know, do you think alcohol companies should sponsor football? Presumably not. How about stuff that causes climate, negative climate change? You know, like Ineos in cycling? Presumably not. What about uh, high calorific foods like the Carabao, you know, energy drinks like Carabao Cup? Well, you know, surely you couldn't have those either. You'd, yeah, I think you have to sort of almost eliminate all sponsorship if if you if if you think gambling can't can't sponsor football clubs. I mean, interesting interesting comment about the football because I mean, for for, for me, whilst I, I recognise what you've said and you, you know you've said uh, that, that the football betting wasn't or didn't seem to be the issue, but for me that was my way in, you know, it, and it, and it was you know my way into gambling, my way into you know. Uh, taking it from from there. I mean, um, what about the marketization of, of of gambling? I mean, for me, for me, it, I mean, for me, it it got to a point where I didn't really enjoy watching football um, because because it was so screwed up. I was betting on, you know, I was happy if the other team scored because uh, you know making bets. And obviously, I don't know if that's unique to me, um, you know, with it having issues or whatever. But um, it's not I mean, unique to you, but but it does, you know, it is. You're at one end of the spectrum, aren't you? Yeah. 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 I mean, what, what, what about in play? Because in play, that, that there's, you must have seen you know, massive growth with in play betting as well with football. Um, yeah, in play, in play has grown since the, um, the start of, since online and, and mobile as well. 
I mean, it was a re- it wasn't a big proportion for Skybet, but it was it did grow. I mean, it was sort of I don't know, you know, thirty uh, percent or something. But then that's what you know. That's a lot of people bet in play, and at relatively small stakes. And you know, if you what are you going to what, stop make that illegal? I mean, to be honest, it's a bit ridiculous to think that to think that you can stop in play betting when there's probably three million people a month, um, maybe more than that, four or five million people a month betting in on in play football. Would yeah. you just stop betting, build a game, kick something? You know, it's not, not realistic. I just think all these sort of you know ideas that people have. I think you're just missing the point. I think we you know, we need we need proper research, we need proper well funded treatment, we need proper self exclusion. That you know, and that's another thing we could talk a lot about. That is mm. more robust than has been, and we've been fine for that, rightly. Um, you know that people should be able to self exclude, and it should be effective. I think we need spend limits uh, that are um, you know that people can't spend more than a certain amount without certain checks, not only on their uh, wealth but on their well being. And that should be first company wide and then industry wide. I think we need to find a way to have less advertising. Um, you know, these are the things that I think we should do. And I think we, you know, the parts of the industry and most of the campaigners would agree on all of that. I think if we start arguing about, I personally think a slot limit for it, that for everyone is a bit of a waste of time. People disagree, fine. Um, and if you start sort of focusing on in-play betting, for example, I mean, it's just a waste of waste of. Oh, oh no, 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 Richard. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting for a minute that you know it's just a ban in in play at all. all right. uh, so I, I don't know. If, uh, giving you the. Right. I, did, I, did, I thought you were saying that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah no. 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 You know. I'll just ban. You know what? We'll ban gambling completely. Yeah, exactly. You know. I, I, I. You know. I get it. I totally get it. I mean, I. I've come from, you know, a lot of my friends said they enjoy betting. You know, a day out of the races is a good day. I, I get, I get it. It's kind of. You know, don't. I'm not trying to see a ban to to, to right. gambling at all. Please, please. You know, um, I think it's funny. I must I must ask you because I've got a friend actually, and and, and um, who's uh, who's actually pretty good at horse racing. Uh, you know, betting and whatnot. Um, and and I did call him yesterday, and I said I've, I've got a call, um, you know, podcast uh, with with you. you know, and uh, I just sort of said, oh, you know, have you got anything you'd like to pose to 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 Richards? And um, he, he did say that he's found that his his accounts have been closed um, because he uh, is, is is successful. Um, it won't and, be closed. This guy it might be restricted. Be cl- was, I mean, it restricted. I, I I can see if he's if he's making if he's on average someone that will make money on betting on horses, he will be restricted. Yeah. Was, and and, that, and it, we have had it's quite, it's quite another topic as you say, but. Um, we have, as Skybet had, you know, quite a few people criticise us for that uh, in the, in horse racing. Um, it's sort of a whole other topic, but happy to go into that if you want. Well, well I just I just wonder if it's ethical because you know, it, surely it should be a fair playing field. And uh, you know, uh, and recently, I, I don't know his name, but the the outgoing chairman of um, is it Labrooks Coral, I think. Um, yeah, GBC Kenny Alexander. There's um, there's a soundbite of him. Um, so saying that 99% of their accounts are losing accounts. Um, you, yeah. you know, I, don't, I just wonder about the ethics there, um, especially with the you know closing of the winning accounts. Yeah, again, it's a whole other topic. And you know, I was in I was in Parliament sort of three or four years on this. I think um, three or four years ago on this. Um, so I think that Kenny Alexander quote was baffled me a bit because, like, it's, when I before I left Skybet but in preparing for this parliamentary session I, I did, we looked in and we found that 75% of accounts lose, not 100%, not 99%. Um, which, so I'm, I'd be very surprised if it, that's every year. I'd be very surprised if at Labrador's call it's 99%. Um, anyway, let's take it as given. And I think, but I think, I do think people should, there should be a general awareness and that, you know, on, av- on average, you'll, if you're betting, particularly on casino products, you will lose. The, you know, the odds are stacked against you. And I don't think uh, people should be allowed to. And, and in fact, they're not. The, the only people you get talking about huge wins and, how, you know, how you are, are lottery. Oh, there's a national lottery. You're not allowed to do that in terms of casino games. And, but I think, you know, people should, it's pretty obvious. And this is why I tell my kids, you know, I'm not telling them they shouldn't gamble, but I say be aware that, you know, that, that the business that I work for, 
was built on pe on people losing money and on average you will lose um whether i think on, on horse racing personally i think again a sort of pragmatically a solution where you can bet uh, a certain amount on the bigger races it, whoever you are as a customer would be a good thing for the industry to adopt a little bit like what you've got in australia but i wouldn't go as far as that and we've you know uh, at scarbo we we had this thing where you can lose i think you could lose you could bet to win up to 500 pounds on the day of the race on on the bigger races um whoever you are whatever level of restriction you were but um you know other outside of that do i think that you should be able to bet and you know if you have in, information or particular insight uh into horse races that that means that you'll always win money do i think we should not limit as a company how much you can bet no i don't it would be crazy for us to say we're going to let you bet you know thousands of pounds uh all the time when we think you're going to win mm. you know we, we, it's a business after all we're, we, we're almost certain to lose money over time to those people mm. we're not going to willingly let those people bet at that higher levels if government was to ever adopt you know something which you say you, you have to lay bets to these people as they've done in australia i don't think it would be a huge issue um but yeah we can't expect us to give money to people well, you know not give money to but um you know on average, on average lose money to people who know more about a certain race or a certain horse than we do so would it be fair i mean Obviously, you said you mass market. You know, Skybet, I'm sure, is a you know big, big company. Uh, and you say you, you know you've got lots of data on your uh, your customers. Um, have you got a certain cohort that you you kind of focus in on? Uh, are we talking you know uh, in certain areas of the country or um, certain age ranges? I mean, our our approach was a sort of to focus on the, the leisure betters in the market. Our our approach was to focus on um people that were relatively low stakes mass market you know sky people that had sky sports that watched football um they tended to be younger than our peer group uh, because we were partly because we were a sort of newer brand and only online um so yeah sort of mass market football punters would was our focus as a company um and the football hackers that you talked about that that's those are low stakes relatively low frequency but high margin um in terms of you know you put a pound on an average on an accumulator the margin so the house would be something like 20 percent, whereas the margin on um horse racing would be like five percent um so yeah that was our focus as a business yeah yeah i mean um <laughs> what i mean uh, I, I don't know are you okay for time are you okay for yeah got, uh if we'll definitely carry on and then i might there's a call i'm expecting i might have to um but probably about another 10 minutes or so cool cool cool, cool. um I've, I've i've almost been having nightmares thinking uh, you know uh, uh, that I, I don't want to miss a, a question i don't want to miss a trick you know having this you can always come back you can always you can always do a follow-up yeah for sure for sure but uh um what, so what do you think about sort of the responsible gambling and and you know the you know when the fun stops stop um is that is that rhetoric is that you know is is that strong enough i mean for for, for me again going back on yeah. the bookies when i saw a pop-up screen saying can you limit your spend i just ignore 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 um obviously i i get there has to be some individual responsibility i'm not sort of going well it's sure. all your fault it's all your fault yeah uh, what, what no you I, I do yeah i think it's i think it's time for a change on when the fun stops stop uh you know i think for for all sorts of reasons I think it's time to change that. I think it's uh I think it's it's hard it's hard to get the right phrase, I have to say. You know, it's easy it's easy to say what you don't like what someone doesn't like. Mm. Um, but it's hard to get something um that is better. And and it's also I think worth you know, a couple of, a couple of I think some people will say that it needs to be a very hard message. Mm. But I, you know, I'm I'm not you know, the the whole that I think certain I think certain customers should get a harder message um, when they are spending far more than they should. You know, a harder message that hopefully cuts through. And, you know, you, you and people like you would be very helpful in working out what would cut through. Um, but I think, uh, uh, you know, you have to remember that those sort of, an equivalent of one of the fun stop stops is going to every customer. And to have a sort of, you know, gambling kills type message, I think 
I don't think is appropriate and relevant uh, for for most people. Um, so I, I wouldn't, you know, it's easy to say don't change when the fun stops stop. Uh, and I think we should, uh, but we need to find out something that's better. So it'll take some work. I also think, I think that, I also think please gamble responsibly. Um, I said, you know, we, we changed our team that looks after this area and we can talk about what they do if you like in a moment, but mm. we changed the name of that team from responsible gambling team to safer gambling team. And I do think that, you know, as a, when we talk internally, we should definitely be talking about providing a safer gambling environment with the right tools and measures. Mm. Um, I do think that it's wrong just to say that if the only thing you do is saying to customers, please gamble responsibly. Uh, it, it doesn't give a balance. It doesn't give the right balance between the operator responsibility and the uh, gambler's responsibility. But it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, people say it should be, it, it is a message at, it is a message at the gambler that, so I don't know quite what, you, you know, it'd be better to say something like please gamble within your means or to have a, a variety of messages there that, are uh that or you know please i don't know what the right we can't do it. i won't be able to do it here and now but I, I think i think they should be changed and more varied and more uh effective and it has become wallpaper both please gamble responsibly and when the fun stops stop so it's time to change them yeah so a long, long answer but I, agree, I agree with basically where you, where you started with it <laughs> i think oh. I, th I just think it's it's such a tricky situation because you know you, you obviously want well, do you want people to gamble responsibly? To be responsible, uh, blah, 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 can't get my words out. Do you want people to uh, to gamble responsibly? Well, this is the what, code, what profit, yeah. You know what? How yeah. such a grey fine line? Because I'm, I'm I'm fully aware that you know the economy benefits, uh, yeah, you know, it provides jobs. But 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 where do you go with that? You know, it, do you? Do well, that's you the fundamental thing. Do? That's the that's the fundamental question. Um, the fundamental question that that you know, and I think that there are. Clearly, some companies that you know haven't wanted people to gamble responsibly. I think, that, and there is a, you know, I think we, I think, you know, as we had, we had very low churn in our customers, and we typically had, you know, very good lifetimes, and we much at a sort of that level, a long sort of long outlook. You'd rather people stay with you and spend for a long period of time rather than gamble far more than they can afford and self-exclude so you know economically you can say well and, and to some degree this is true that you do want uh, people to gamble responsibly because ultimately it's better for business also stops you getting fined and stops you getting um uh stops the industry reputation from suffering but that you know you, ca you can't be naive about that and this is where regulation has to come in and people need to be moral as well people need to you know and then i think there are a lot of moral, there are a lot of people in gambling companies that are very concerned about these issues and want to make sure that a company doesn't exploit people that, um, that, that aren't gambling responsibly. So I think, whereas in the past, people are more focused on the metrics and wouldn't necessarily want customers to gamble responsibly. I think it's changing, but I think that the, the industry should, should be regulated, is regulated and should be perhaps more tightly regulated and more specifically regulated so that um, gambling companies can't profit from people being exploited and you know gambling in an irresponsible way. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, is it Flutter.com that's the over? The overall, yeah. Flutter Entertainment PLC. Flutter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Technical, yeah. yeah. The, the, the overriding kind of uh, you know um, you know company or, or whatever yeah. you call it. Um, is that? I'm just thinking, you know, with mergers and acquisitions and, and things like that, when, when a company becomes this big umbrella, you know, when it's got all these brands and stuff, you know, have they got so much power now that actually the government are thinking, well, actually, you know, you know who, who's got more power in, in this, you know, uh, like, like you, you mentioned in terms of with the government, you know, do you think actually the government do need to be harder, you know, and, and tougher uh, to, to, to put the regulation in, you know? I'm not, not, I'm not saying who's to blame yeah. per se, but no, no. Um, I, think, I think we need. I think we need a good, well, a, a well-regulated industry that I think means more regulated in certain areas than it has been. Um, and I, don't, I think that um, you know, in regards to power, I mean, flood, you know, I think uh, this is one thing that I think is a bit of a myth that the that the gambling industry has some sort of power over. You know, it's 
nonsense than what I've seen, to be honest. You know, and, and I mean, take the fob, that Fobti situation. That was, there was a lot of jobs uh, and a lot of sort of, um, you know, Labrooks and Coral and William Hill and to some degree Paddy Power as well. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, high street presence and the industry completely lost that. It went to the worst possible from the industry point of view. You know, I'm not talking about the ethics of it. I'm talking about purely the economics of it. The, the worst economic outcome that the industry um, could have had. Um, and that showed if anyone ever had any doubt that the industry doesn't have uh, you know, any power over government. And I don't think it does now either. Um, and, you know, I think, but I think that, the, and I think when people, people often say that when they don't get the outcome they want. Um, but in reality, there are other interests. There are, there are customers that want to be able to spend more than two pounds on slots. And there are um, also, there, there should be a recognition that if you do that, the consequences could be negative for everyone. Um, I don't have a particular problem with that, but blah, 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 you know, theory. Um, so I don't think the industry has power over government. Um, I do think that, um, yeah, we need, need to up, but you know, I do, as running a gambling business, one of the issues I found was that a lot of the regulations of what, what you have to do with accounts that look like they're spending more than they should are very gray, very vague. And we end up having to, we end up having to, you know, we, we ended up imposing limits on lots of accounts because we felt it was the right thing to do and going beyond, you know, we did, going beyond what regulators required us to. And I, you know, I'd rather actually have a, have more of a sort of set of firm metrics on there that you can up to spend up to a certain amount. You can do X, spend up above that amount. You need to do Y. And I think, you know, I think then we'd raise standards in the whole across the whole sector which i think will be better for the more responsible operators yeah i mean i mean ultimately this is a very sensitive question um but you know it, cool. it, only, it only seems fair because you know as i said i've, I've lost you know cool. you uh, can ask it. friends or friends or whatever but um you know how does it sit morally that, that you that there are people that take their own lives um because of problem gambling that ultimately you know you're involved in this industry uh, how, how does that make you feel yeah i think of course that's made me think a lot about um the industry and about my role in it and i've spent hours and hours thinking about that and you know, it hasn't hasn't been something that you know probably every day i think about that but you know i'm not so much in the industry now but when i was more active in it, every day i think about that sort of when you read a story or talk to somebody you would question what you do and question the industry but you know uh, fundamentally you know do i think that my actions you know have caused that you know in reality I, you know i would always i do always done my best in different situations and done my best not to exploit people with gambling addiction and you think you know should I've done different things in terms probably some things you think yes, but um but fundamentally would I do I regret running a gambling business and then regret the way we ran it over that time? Fundamentally I don't. And fundamentally I would have done some things differently, but I wouldn't have done uh you know, I didn't knowingly um run a run a business that exploited people and even and I you know, even looking back at it now, the vast number of people that the the business served were your everyday regular gamblers, you know, go back to sort of working in pubs, you know, have I ever, do you ever serve someone a drink that is, is an alcoholic or has gone off and crashed their car? Maybe I have, um, you know, do, did I sort of go to work every day thinking, um, you know, how many pints I can give to people who are going to, uh, you know, drink themselves to death or drive drunk? No, of course not. You drink, you, you go about your business, the fun of the core of the business was to make the watching the match more exciting, and that was most of what we did. And you know, do, would would I have regretted individual actions? Yes, <clears throat> but do I regret the job that I did? No. 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 I mean, would you? Uh, I mean, do you? What, what what are those reg regrets? Are they are they as I say, are they individual things or moments, or is it policy within the company? Uh, what, what what are those regrets? Yeah. It's probably a bit of both. I mean, there are, I think, I mean, we, we got fined for something that shouldn't have happened. So clearly regret that. 
I probably regret that we didn't, um, as a company, uh, you know, do some of this stuff that we ended up doing sooner. Yes. Do I, I think, you know, I could have played more of a role in the industry. Um, you know, we were a lot focused internally for a lot of years and we, as a smaller player in the industry in the sort of 2010 to 2015, you know, we didn't influence things at an industry level as much as, uh, I could have done. Um, there are, there were individual decisions made about customers that obviously won't go into the, um, that I think looking back, I've done differently. Um, are they the VR are some, teams? Sorry, Richard, were they, are they the VR yeah. teams? Yeah. We did, we, well, yes, insofar as we had them. I and mean, we, we didn't, we had, didn't have, we haven't got any VR. It's, it's a tiny part of the business. I mean, if you go to the sort of, the guys that appeared in my successor that appeared in front of the uh, laws gave some of the data on it. I think it was 2% of um, revenue from VIPs, whereas um, with the Labrador's Core, it's 40, 48%. I might have got those numbers wrong and they're on the public record, so you can find them. But I think, I think looking back, um, you know, there were people in, before we sort of got a handle on, you know, understood these issues better in these sort of 2010 to 2015 type times. And some will have happened afterwards as well. Uh, there are there are people that should have had more monitoring and more control than they did. Um, so I, w I do regret that. Um, and any that have, any that have haven't had the right level of monitoring control after that, I would also regret. Although that, you know that was more, they were more the exception through some that slipped through. You know they, we realised we did have a million customers a week. You know you, ca you can't. There are limits to what you can do. Um, with a million with individual customers when you've got quite that number um so yeah so both there were things i would have done differently both at the sort of policy level and at the um individual custom level but i you know go back to you know i think we built we built the business um in you know built the business with a mass market customer base that uh was at the better end of um of industry behavior and we always tried to improve and we always tried to have a culture of of doing the right thing and um and you know well and trying to understand and address these issues insofar as you can as a gambling company no no okay thank you no 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 thank you yeah. for, i mean I mean, I feel, I feel like, you know, we, I feel like I could talk all day as, as, as yeah. a podcast. I feel like, as, People you know, get bored. Yeah. <laughs> there'd be, I'm sure there'll be stuff that I've missed out, but I'm just flicking through my sort of show notes and uh, I think, I think I've pretty much covered off everything I wanted to say. Um, have you got anything else you wanted to sort of say to wrap up? Anything that you sort of wanted to mention that you haven't? No, I think the only thing, you know, I've always, I believe that I'm a sort of someone that, We'll try and hear all all of all sides of a debate, and I, I think I think we I think there's a lot more to be gained than to lost by having a good dialogue between people like yourself and you know like others that you're speaking to who uh, understand gambling addiction from a personal point of view. A dialogue between industry folk and people like you, I think, is is a is a big positive. You know, it really does. One thing that I really do have an issue with is when you know people who speak to the gambling industry are somehow seen as pariahs in the sort of in the concerned gambling folk on on you know on social media you know you know realize how damaging that is for moving the whole thing forward and I, you know i think in the same way as sometimes the gambling industry um of stereotypes people that spend too much on gambling as you know either uh, people without uh, not able to control them themselves or not able to exercise responsibility or somehow the issue being all about them that's that's the wrong way to think about things in the same way that other people just think that the in, you know it's all the industry's fault and you know they're evil people are just trying to exploit addicts i think that is also largely wrong and certainly superficial i think the more we can have a dialogue um then I think the industry will improve and I think we'll have a more honest understanding of where we can move forward and, and solve things and where things might be counterproductive. So appreciate you doing this, appreciate you inviting me on it. And, you know, I hope that we can have a, a, a debate across the whole of people involved in these issues. Thank you very much for, uh, well, thank you for coming on and, uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, well, it's, it's a privilege to talk to, to you and uh, to, to hear your point of view. And, and as I say, I think, I think for me, just to, you know, closing comments, but I think you've hit the nail on the head there, actually, is, is that if, if we can have a, a, a group discussion, you know, if we can sit around the table and, you know, uh, all these different stakeholders, because it, it, at the moment, it, my perception is it does feel like a, a bit of a, you know, over the fence, you know, sort of just, you know, pointing fingers at each other sort of thing. And, uh, exactly. and I think that's what we should avoid. Exactly. That's what we should avoid. So, um, thanks ever so much. <laughs> Great. No problem. I hope I'm not going to have a, you know, anything I'm sure you wouldn't do. Is it? I've, I've a little bit of, uh, the next Kenny Alexander having a exerted clip <laughs> sitting around the internet. But anyway, mm -hmm. I haven't said anything that, uh, well, anyway, no. we'll see. Um, yeah. But um, I will see you soon. And uh, yeah, all right. And uh, thanks very much. Okay, cheers, Alex. Pleasure. It was a real pleasure talking to Richard and hearing from an industry insider. Thanks once again to him for talking so openly and sharing his knowledge and insight with us. As always, plenty of takeaways from the conversation. I was actually left a bit mind boggled. Gambling touches on social, economic, and political issues is a subject that is hard to circumnavigate from all sides of the table. I would agree that by increasing dialogue amongst all stakeholders, we will gain better understanding and help move the conversation forward to make gambling safer in the future. I also agree that we need to change the public discourse around the responsible gambling rhetoric and that we need to bring in neutral research and a statutory levy. However, a lot still needs to be done to prevent children from gambling normalisation gambling advertisements and sponsorships. So, it's been great to hear from Richard and to hear his unique point of view. In the final episode of the Invisible Addiction podcast series, I speak with Matt Saab Cousin, Britain's leading campaigner who heads up the Clean Up Gambling campaign. What changes would he like to see made to gambling legislation in the UK?